Good morning, everybody on YouTube. My name is Reverend Jack Abel. I'm the Senior Director of Spiritual Care at Karen Treatment Centers. I know many of you know who I am. This is the Sunday Chapel service for January 10th, 2021. And um, really, really excited to have you uh, watching and to be here in the auditorium with patients in person and to be also broadcasting live stream around to other locations on the campus. I know there are those of you who are watching in other spots. So thanks and grateful to be with you. I, um, I came into my own recovery a long time ago. Um, many of you heard last week that I was celebrating the anniversary, which I'm grateful for your enthusiastic support. And one of, I came to my recovery as an atheist. And somewhere along in the first couple of months, I wanted to flee because I had this feeling that I had been like uh, sucked into some religious cult. But the truth was I was really enjoying AA and it was actually really working. So I was like, ugh. And I didn't, you know, they weren't asking for my life savings or the rights to my firstborn children or, you know, like it, it, I was waiting for the hook, but, um, so I stayed even though early in my sobriety I was oblivious to, and then suddenly in my first few months of sobriety, I started hearing very strongly what I interpreted as a religious message. And one of the ways that message was communicated very strongly at that time, and still is communicated very strongly in AA, is one of the reasons why people do, like, ping off of AA and say, I'm not doing that, it's not for me, was that its third of the 12 steps said, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Very particular language, the capital H, him is a problem for some people, even the capital G, God, word is a problem for some people, and the turning one's life and one's will over um, is a problem for people. The, it, the third step is, is um, integral to the 12-step recovery experience. And it gets um, tacked with various sort of summary labels and descriptions. Uh, one of the short monikers for steps one, two, and three is came, came to, came to believe. But uh, I would say that maybe the most dominant one word description of the third step is it's a surrender step. It's a step in which, and you'll find even in clinical settings here at Karen, where we try to also introduce people to other recovery traditions, the new recovery drama movement and other expressions. Um, I was, I was just looking at a couple of patients that are on the milieu where I happen to have something to do in the lecture on surrender versus compliance. And so, surrender continues to be a perennial theme in addiction recovery. It was absolutely, and is absolutely central in AA, but I think it's, it's a central spiritual theme in many traditions, and it's, uh, it's a problem for lots of folks. So, I need to remember my outline, I never do this, but, um, oh, so my second point was, not only is surrender essential in the 12-step movement, but I like to point out that I misunderstood surrender early on, and I think people, many people make the mistake that I would say I made. I'm not saying there's only one right way of doing these things or understanding these things, but what evolved in my understanding was that I had shifted from thinking about surrender as a once and done thing, to thinking about it as a cascading, unfolding, for the mathematicians in the room, fractal kind of thing. Like a pin that shatters glass and the ripple effects. I, my surrender has to widen and be relevant every day and in various different ways. So for the Karen patient, I think many Karen patients think they surrender at the intervention when their family members or their boss or the treatment professional or the cops or whatever it was said, you know, dude, like, you're done unless you go to treatment. And you said, I, I, okay, I surrender, I'll go to treatment. But that's only the first of a whole series of these acquiescences, these giving ups, these letting goes, these ostensible defeats that are hard on the journey of recovery. Um, one of the ways it also expresses itself for many of us, I'm not going to tell you my whole sordid story, but 
I have not had a drink in a very long time, but I have learned about a thing they call here addiction interaction disorder. So Amazon and I have an issue, and I have not really surrendered entirely to the one-click retail therapy issue. Um, I like to tell people I don't eat cookies, I do cookies. So, um, I, in other words, and that's a surrender I have not yet made, and, um, or I try to make it every day. But I have prayers that I say in the morning that are prayers of my daily surrender, and I have an end of the day review where I kind of look at what was more surrendered and less about my day. And so that's my, that's what, that was my second point. I wanted to say, as I speak to you about surrender, I'm not talking about it once and done. I'm talking about adopting a disposition, about um, realizing that there is a set of moments ahead in your life. All human beings have moments of choice in an unfolding, extraordinary pilgrimage in front of us. That's what life does. Life flows choice after choice after choice. And first it's you want mashed potatoes or french fries, and then it's like, what is the name of your baby? And then it's like, what are you going to do because you think that's skin cancer? And then it's, you know, like, it's just all kinds of choices. One thing after another. You're going to have sober living versus, you know, IOP versus like blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you're going to feel like nobody's giving you enough choices and you want more choices or whatever. But, but, but a principle that enters into the recovery narrative is the notion of surrender. And I want to like stay with it for a minute. So, not only is surrender an unfolding, cascading reality rather than a one-time thing, central and alcoholics anonymous, but thirdly, surrender is pretty unpopular, especially like today. And I don't mean that in, in direct address of political events of the last week, as bizarre as they were, or um, uh, this is not partisan or anything. I, I think we, in American culture, this may very well go back to the frontier revival, wild, wild west, you know, like um, there's something about North American, Western, and American culture in particular that, especially I think in the 21st century, still sharpens its knife on the blade of self-reliance. You are in the end, the, this narrative is like, it all depends on you. If, if, in, in the crunch time, it's going to be only you. If you, if, you, if you haven't got your back, nobody else is going to have your back. It's like all of this sort of thing. And you, too, can become anything. When I was a child, you know, uh, it, it was like every little boy, white boy was told, oh, you can be president or whatever. Whatever that narrative is, it's this, it's this idea of my own capacity to spin a world and be the master of my universe that I think at some point when you come into Alcoholics Anonymous and people start talking about surrender, like, I'm not surrendering. I don't like the idea of surrender. Whether it was your dad or your older brother or your uh, a, a powerful female figure in your life or whoever, like, I, I always thought, you know, like, fight, I fight, I fight, fight to the death, don't ever give up. No! No surrender. Hell no, we're not going to surrender. So, this is tricky because here I am trying to say, can we revisit the topic? And I'm asking you to revisit the topic when I think there are examples around us, including in your own life. I, I'm not a Dr. Phil fan, but I like Dr. Phil's like sort of go-to question, which is, how's it working for you? I'm not trying to be rude, but... You might notice you have a wristband. You're in a 28 day or longer stay in the treatment center. So uh, the AA expression is my best thinking got me here. You know, like, um, I'm wondering if the fight, 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 achieve, 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 solitary accomplishment, solitary accomplishment, solitary accomplishment, if that narrative isn't worth re-examining, especially on admission treatment. I have watched pride and stoicism be the last thing on the face of people who die. Um, 
And this is what this leads me nicely to the fourth of my five points, which is that um, I learned, and I have a favorite story to tell about this, was um, I went to a weird college. It's called Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. It is a weird college. I actually studied for two years at the New School in New York City, which is another weird college, and then I transferred to Hampshire, so I'm like doubly weird in my undergraduate formation. But I love my time in Hampshire. I was totally stoned and high most of it, but, but they taught me a lot. And um, I don't know, I was on this hippie quest thing. So I went to a very hippie school. I got there in 1979. And I think when you get admitted to a college, you know, one of the things that you do when you're a young person is you go to the bookstore. I, I, was, I was looking for like, do they have like a sticker to put in the back of a car for my mom? And I, you know, like I was going to get a sweatshirt or that kind of stuff. And I wanted the swag. And um, I don't think we called it swag at that point, but I wanted to see what the, I probably would have said paraphernalia. That's, that's a clue to how sick I am. Anyway, so I'm in Hampshire College in the Hampshire College bookstore, which I remember very well. It's not a fancy campus. It's, it had its own kind of austere beauty in a weird way. But anyway, I'm in there and I'm looking at clothing and there's a hoodie, which for, I bought this hoodie the day of my arrival there and I, I had it for years and years and years. I don't have it anymore. But I loved this shirt because it looked like the classic college football team jersey. Hampshire College, big football in the middle. The little tree emblem there. And it, it said, I have to think for a minute, I think the college was just coming up on its 25 year anniversary, so 1979, that would have put its founding around maybe 1954 or something like that. Anyway, it was pre-60s, but it was very 60s-ish. So anyway, so um, Hampshire College, undefeated since 1954, whatever the founding year of the college. And I'm like, how is that possible? And the retail person was like, no team. <laughs> the only organized team at Hampshire College was the ultimate Frisbee team. There's a couple of people giggling in the room. I don't know how you're feeling on YouTube or on the thing, but I am not, I, I think there's actually a profound point embedded in there, which AA tries to communicate to the new arrival often with a very simple three word phrase, surrender to win. I tangled with Johnny Walker Red night after night. I battled Johnny. I think some nights I thought I won, but in the end, Johnny always exacted more from me than I intended to give in to him. And in the end, it was like a brutal and absolute, utter, complete defeat. And so there's a paradox in surrender, which is that it's a paradoxical victory. Like the ironic Hampshire College shirt. What I'm saying to you is that this spiritual principle that Reverend Jack is talking about this morning invites you not to lose, but to win. Did I buy a lot of tickets this week? I'll confess I did, but I already didn't win the Mega Billions. I have to check the Powerball. So, and I never buy a lot of tickets because of the principle of surrender. Like I. I I just know I'm going to lose. Like, so, I think the alcoholic who continues to try and drink is about as likely to succeed as I am at Powerball. So, there's an inevitability of my defeat in that area, and there's an inevitability of your defeat in this area, I would argue, since you're, you're, you're a patient here. It's for you to decide. I do realize that. I can't, I can't tell you that you're attempts to continue to control this will be futile, except that I can tell you that's what I have watched over and over and over again. So I'm kind of like, how deep do you want your bottom to be? And like the jokes are, well, I hit a bottom and then I got a shovel and then I went, to, like, just make your bottom deeper. Like just, God bless you, but I'm, I get tired of making phone calls to families apologizing, or not apologizing, but being sad and commiserating with them because of the deaths of our alumni from overdose and suicide. So I would love to look in this room and go, I'm pretty sure none of you are going like, to go out and do advanced research or test the waters again or whatever. I can't be sure of that. I'm pretty sure many of you will drink and use again. 
hopefully in an educational way, hopefully in a way that is therapeutic and brings you ultimately to an admission of, a daily admission of complete defeat. But I know many people who have gone back and died on first use. Like they think they can do the heroin level that they used to be able to do and their body can no longer tolerate that amount or there's fentanyl and the dope that they didn't know was in there or whatever and so it is, it's a game of Russian roulette and it's a very serious question for you whether you are ready to admit defeat. I am. Um, my last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to pay tribute to a Karen hero who is an unsung Karen hero. A name I'm sure probably no one in this room knows. Um, but anyway, when I was early in my sobriety, there was a woman who functioned as an interventionist in my family for my mother's entrance into treatment. And then I sought her out as a therapist and she helped me. And then she left to go work at a place in treatment, which I had never heard of, but it turned out to be here. And she worked here for many years in what is called today the Breakthrough Program. So she was a very, very creative and energetic, and Breakthrough is like a fascinating, for those of you who do IEPs, Intensive Experiential Programming, IEP is a little mini breakthrough experience embedded within the treatment thing. Her name was Barbara Teal. Barbara was a, excuse my language, kick butt clinician. She was, you know what I was gonna say. And she was an amazing clinician. She was gutsy, she was, and I remember her telling me when I started to work with her that she was gonna be very tough on me, but that she would pick me up when the hard things that she would say to me would make me flinch or wanna fall. And that indeed turned out to be true. She was very clever with the way she worked with me because I like to think I'm smart. At that point, I had this young, exuberant, brash, narcissism, pride, and ego that needed... I was, I, was, I was danger to myself and others. And in that kind of like smart alecky way. So anyway, I started seeing Barbara for therapy. And um, I worked in a small retail establishment near her office. We were both from Southern Delaware, so she just died this past week, and I just got word from somebody here. God, God, this woman was such a... Such. Anyway, I would go see Barbara, like, let's say my appointment was Tuesdays at 11 o'clock, whatever, so I had to look good. You know, khakis and a shirt and a tie. It was, I, it was a small retailer, but an office products thing, so I like to try to look professional, and I would go, and she'd be like, well, tell me about your family. And I, I, I did therapy about my dad, and I did therapy about my mom, and I did therapy about my siblings. And my family system had a lot of complicated stuff that had occurred, and so there was a lot for me to do. And I think she was toying with me by allowing me to be very analytical. I was like, I was like, oh, I was all into the whole thing and everything. And one day she said, Jack, I'm just feeling funny today. I want you to go up to the board there. She had like a whiteboard on the wall. And she said, let's start diagramming some of this stuff out. So I had my mom, I had my dad, I had my siblings, I had like, and I, there was this like little map of my family system. And then she started like, I don't even know how she did it, but she, she started turning the temperature up on the stove of this analysis. And I suddenly, she got me really pissed off. I got really mad at her like rooting around and saying whatever. I don't remember, I'm sure she either said something about my mother, about my father, about my family, about my brother, about me or whatever. But I spun around and I was like, screw you. You know, like, I, I like, I was like, I think I'm done with this. And she goes, no, this is perfect. This is exactly where I wanted you. She said, give me just a second. She opened like a closet door. She brought out this big, huge foam block and she brought out this bat, which had like a like a, a big foam, looked like a foam tennis racket. It was called a bataka. It was a tool used in years past, still used in some settings for this kind of experiential therapy. It was an anger expression tool. And she's like, I want you to look at that map on the wall, and I want you to say what you need to say. So I have no idea what my magic formula words were, but I, I, I pummeled this foam block for the remainder of my 60 minute session. And at the end of it, I'm in, I have a tie and a shirt. And I'm like, really? 
I'm like, really? You did this to me? It's a work day. And she's like, go home, take a shower, call in and take the rest of the day off. You did great. I remember, she was like, you did, you did great. That day changed my life. Like, I was so angry at so many things. And I always tried to keep a lid on it and keep it together and keep it like, make, it, make myself and the other people around us look good and tell the looking good story of it. And, and I finally I gave up. I, I like just exploded and it was one of the most therapeutic moments I have ever, ever had. And I owe it to Barb. And uh, years later, so she, she called me years later. She's like, hey, are you still doing the churchy thing? And I'm like, actually I am. She goes, have you ever thought about working in addiction treatment? And I said, oh, I actually did. I had a whole story about that. And she's like, oh, you know the place I went in Pennsylvania? I just talked to the priest there and I said, if you would take somebody who wasn't Catholic, I might know the guy. So she put a word in for me with Father Bill. And I ended up coming here because of Barbara and interviewing. And that also changed my life. So. In the surrender, you have un unlooked for treasures and gifts that will come. But you just have to decide, my friends, how long are you going to keep fighting? Are you really, are you really sure you got this? You know how to win this game? I don't. I'm not my own. I am in the circle. I'm not my own. I belong with it. This is life beyond us.